Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Roberto Gonzalez, and I'm uh, a professor of education here uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm, I'm beyond thrilled um, to welcome my very good friend uh, and colleague, Leo Chavez, um, to speak to us this afternoon as part of our DACA seminar. Uh, but before I, I introduce uh, Professor Chavez, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Inequality in America Initiative, the Harvard University Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Committee on Ethnicity, Migration and Rights, the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History, Harvard Act on a Dream, um, and Define America. I'm also like to thank my fellow co-organizers, Walter Johnson, Kirsten Weld, and, and David Carrasco. Um, this event is part of a, a, a multi-event series. I think that we're somewhere around in the neighborhood of 17, 17 events, or maybe 20, um, this semester on campus. Uh, it's an effort that we're engaged uh, in, in service to opening up a space of learning and dialogue to our campus and the larger community around questions related to the termination of DACA, to the termination of TPS, deportations, the current state of our immigration policy uh, and its implications for young people, parents, families, communities, scholars, artists, workers, policymakers, and practitioners. We see this wind down period of DACA as a window through which to discuss not only DACA, but also a host of immigration related issues that impact a wide range of the American public. Through a series of events on campus, uh, running between we started in late January, um, through uh, April, um, it's our hope to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders in an effort to gain a better understanding of the issues at hand while engaging various viewpoints. Um, just a preview of coming attractions. Um, tomorrow um, at Oberon, um, this event, Little Tiny Walls, um, which is a, a performance and conversation at the intersection of arts, activism, and social responsibility. Uh, we'll be premiering a piece uh, by that title, Little Tiny Walls, uh, by six-time Grammy Award-winning uh, composer um, Arturo Ferro, um, along with a panel, Arturo, uh, Cornell West, myself, um, and, and others, uh, Brenda Esqueda Morales, who's a, a, a student here at, at the college. Um, this event, unfortunately, is sold out. It's been sold out. It was a ticketed one, the only one of our events that is ticketed, and it's, it is sold out, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully some of you all have, have tickets. And then on February 26th, that's, uh, that's a week from Monday, um, we've got uh, the impact of TPS repeal uh, on Harvard workers' stories. This is an important, really local um, story. Uh, we see that the, the termination of DACA, the termination of TPS, and the profound effects it's had nationwide, closer to home on our campus are students and workers who are impacted directly by this. Uh, and we'll have a chance to hear from, from some of our uh, Harvard workers. So, and then a final announcement um, from EMR. Um, EMR is holding... Uh, this semester, a spoken word workshop series, um, a really fantastic schedule. Um, so if people are interested, um, contact Eleanor Craig, Eleanor uh, underscore Craig at fas.harvard.edu, um, or look on the EMR Ethnicity, Migration, and Rights uh, website. And now without further ado, um, I want to introduce um, Professor Chavez. Uh, Professor Leo Chavez received his PhD from Stanford University and is currently a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California at Irvine. Um, in addition to close to 100 academic articles, um, Leo is the author of The Classic Shadowed Lives, Undocumented Immigrants in, in, in American Society, really the first ethnography on undocumented immigrants, um, cover, covering immigration, popular images, and, and the politics of the nation, um, and the Latino threat Constructing Immigrants, Citizens, and the Nation. Um, Shadowed Lives is, is in its third edition. Uh, Latino Thread is in its second, second edition. Um, Professor Chavez's most recent book um, is Anchor Babies and the Challenge of Birthright Citizenship. Um, Professor Chavez has received numerous awards over the years, is, is really 
regarded nationally and internationally as an expert um, at the intersection of, of immigration, health, and a number of, of related issues. Um, he's a recipient of the, uh, 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 the Margaret Mead Award, uh, the Association of Latino and Latino Anthropologists Book Award for Latino Threat, and the Society for Anthropology of North America Award for Distinguish, Distinguished Achievement in the Critical Study of North America. Um, personally, um, we've been friends for about 15 years. Um, Leo was on my, my dissertation committee in graduate school. Um, and I'm just, the second time I've been able to bring him here to Harvard. Um, so please, please, please give a warm welcome uh, for Professor Leo Chavez. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. And I'd like to thank the DACA seminar for inviting me and uh, uh, thank Robin for giving me all the emails. And I had to call her up in the middle of the night because I didn't know how to get here and, and uh, my Uber didn't show up. So what was it, about four in the morning? I can't remember what it was, but my seven or something. And, um, and Roberto, of course, seeing Roberto do so well. It's just great. I was on his, grad, his uh, dissertation committee. And despite that, look where he wound up. I mean, it's just, it's, just, uh, it's phenomenal, actually, to see what he was able to do. Uh, and so I'm talking about anchor babies and other uh, immigration-related stigmatizing speech. Uh, it's related to DACA, as you'll see, but it's really related in a much more general way, perhaps. Um, and I want to start with a prologue to the speech. And I want to talk a prologue around the children of immigrants more generally. And basically, are the children of immigrants a problem? And if so, why? Under what kind of imagined world that we live in are the children of immigrants a problem? And this isn't a new question. You know, it, it wasn't too long ago that the New York Times, which we now see as a, a bastion of liberal, doing really bad, doing really bad uh, 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 writing, is, would write about immigrants in a very negative way, particularly the children of immigrants who are U.S. citizens. As they wrote in 1882, I think it was, a bad Irish-American boy is about as unwholesome a product as was ever reared in any body politic. New York Times, May 15th, 1880. The head of the census in 1870 and 1889 was talking about the children of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, Italians, Czechoslovakians, Russian Jews, Greeks, uh, Hungarians, saying even though they're born among us, they're US citizens, that really they're not wholly of us. So separate has been their social life due alike to their clannishness and to our reserve so strong have been their ties of race and blood and religion, et cetera, that we think of them, and probably always will, as foreigners. Of course, look around Harvard, turn on the television, read anything. The people who run this country, the cultural, political, and economic people in this country are all the children they're talking about and their grandkids. The people who would never be Americans are about as American now as apple pie. But the children seem to pose a particular threat, it seems like, to existing, quote, natives. And 100 years ago, a book was written by a guy named Madison Grant called The Passing of the Great Race or The Racial Bias of European History, a classic piece of writing, uh, what we would call today scientific racism, and basically pushing the idea of eugenics. And of course, that's about reproduction, which is about producing children. And of course, immigrant women were the key target of a lot of this. And he wrote, and I'm not going to give you the whole book, just couple little quick things in it. He wrote, in America, we have nearly succeeded in destroying the privilege of birth. That is, the intellectual and moral advantage of a man of good stock brings into the world. We Americans must realize that the altruistic ideals which have controlled our social development during the past century, and he's talking about the 1800s now, and the maudlin sentimentalism, I love that term, maudlin sentimentalism, that has made America an asylum for the oppressed are sweeping the nation toward a racial abyss, the children of immigrants. One of my own predecessors, Franz Boas, a German Jew, from, basically wrote in a review in, in, you know, 100 years ago almost exactly of Grant's book, the book's object is to show that democratic institutions and the arrival of immigrants of non-West European type are a danger to the welfare of the American people. He fought a valiant effort against nativism did Franz Boas, and try and get Americans to think differently about race. Unfortunately, he lost. So in 1922, 1924, we passed some very racist quota system, allowing mainly Northern and Eastern Europeans to come into the country, severely limiting these people who would never be Americans, Southern and Eastern Europeans. Asians, by the way, were already pretty much barred. 
So, 100 years ago, what's happened since then? Well, I wrote a book called Anchor Babies because it's interesting the context around which Anchor Babies is published is very similar to the context in which Grant wrote his book 100 years ago. It's a new nativism that Horace Grant and his book would feel very comfortable in and would really clearly recognize as setting up a set of ideas about what the problem is, mainly immigrants and particularly their children. And we have, for example, this fellow named Jess Sessions, U.S. Attorney General, and he wrote and said basically that he thought the 24 immigration law, which we, we basically restricted through national origin quotas, people such as most Asians, of course, Italians, Jews, Africans, Middle Easterners, and other Southern Asian Europeans, was really a good idea for America. And as we know, this is what we're kind of moving towards. That was, those were what we call when America was great. When America was great. Trump's immigration proposal is all about moving towards the early 18, late 1800s, early 1900s style of thinking about immigration. Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller, both pushed Trump into restricting and thinking about restricting immigration, both undocumented and legal, in favor of Europeans, particularly who have English as a requisite, and other kinds of educational skills in order to return the American demographic profile back into an earlier profile when America was great again. Representative Steve King, one of the, one of the basic promoters of the ideas of Bannon and, 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 and Miller and Trump, recently said, culture and demographics are our destiny. We can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. So I'm trying to get it very clear. When I'm talking about anchor babies, I'm really talking about something more general, the threat of the children of immigrants. As a candidate, Trump promised to get rid of birthright citizenship. Basically, eliminate birthright citizenship for the children of undocumented immigrants. I heard recently on the news that as DACA passes, as we deal with immigration reform, somebody said the next big battle is the 14th Amendment. All right? So how is it seen? Why, are these, why is this a problem? Well, as candidate Trump said, they, and he means Americans, are disgusted when a woman who's nine months pregnant walks across the border and has a baby, and you have to take care of that baby for the next 85 years. Of course, you guys aren't on the West Coast, but we you know we're pushing people away from the easy places to cross the border, pushing them into places like Arizona, where it's 140 degrees. Can you imagine? I've never been pregnant, obviously. I couldn't imagine being eight and a half months pregnant and saying, gee, I think I'm going to walk across 140 degree heat to go deliver my baby. It just seems illogical. And of course, the fact that this baby for 85 years would make no contribution to America, to our economy, to our culture, to our society, and we'd have to basically take care of that baby, has a whole bunch of assumptions built into that comment, right? As takers, as bleeders as people who somehow we're going to, as Americans, have to be responsible for and never get anything back. What, they're, what are they doing? They're having a baby, and then all of a sudden, nobody knows. The baby's here. They're illegal. You either have a country or you don't, or, you, or not. I'd much rather find out whether or not anchor babies are citizens, because a lot of people don't think they are. You know, he has a lot of really high-priced lawyers. They don't seem to be very good ones, but they're pretty high-priced, who seem to be giving him all kinds of legal information. So how did the children of immigrants become such a problem or perceived as a problem? And of course, there are different types of children of immigrants. There's the one point, what we in academia call the 1.5 generation, those who are born someplace else but come here as children and are raised here, and for all intents and purposes may wind up at Harvard because they speak English, did well in school, and achieved, right? There's nothing blocking that except for immigration status. They, many of them are called dreamers. Some of them are called DACA if they have DACA protections against deportation. And then there's the second generation children of immigrants who were born here. They're citizens. Surely they're not a problem. They're Americans. But we just saw historically they can be just as much as a problem as anyone else. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about DACA and the 1.5 because you guys have a whole seminar on it. So I'll be talking more about what the topic of my book is, basically, uh, birthright citizenship. So let's go back a little bit to put it in context, because no matter how much we have fun 
looking at Donald Trump's comments, he didn't invent those comments. He comes out of a context over the last 50 years where these ideas have been given form, shape, intellectual framing, media representations, and a whole bunch of just talk in bars, radio talk shows, and anywhere else people like to spew their venom. So it's, hey, he didn't invent this, these comments. This has come out of a clear public verbal discourse or political discourse. Look back in the 70s. You know, there was not a lot of immigration from Mexico, as we'll see in a minute, in the 1950s and 60s. When I grew up, most people who have Mexican descent, for example, were actually citizens because they came in earlier waves. That, of course, changes as immigration starts in the 70s, 80s, until today, of course, about 44% of Mexican origin people are actually immigrants. So it's a, there was a big change. What happens in the 70s is that as, as more people are coming in the post-1965 era, you have a way to interpret this as a bad thing. Because they were really coming to work, but they were often staying and having kids. And so the issue is, why do we have people coming here who are undocumented? And one of the first issues they focus on, and you'll see it here, time bomb in Mexico. Why there'll be no end to the invasion of illegals. And of course, what's the time bomb? I gave you a hint. I put Paul Ehrlich's name on the co column. What's Paul Ehrlich write about? The population bomb. They took the idea and said, the time bomb in Mexico, it's women with their biological clocks ticking, and they can't control it. They can't control it because they're Catholics, and therefore, they can't control their reproductive capacity because of the church, and because they're Latin, and Latins like to have a lot of kids. Women have to prove they're women, and men have to prove they're men by impregnating a lot of women. And so you have this little series of discussions going on about why in Mexico there's a time bomb of women who just can't control their fecundity who are going to produce all these babies to come to the United States as undocumented immigrants. Now, Paul Ehrlich, of course, was a biologist. He studied termites. Termites build these huge nests and eventually explode and the queens take off to make other nests. He envisioned Mexico in that way. Just really quickly, none of the projections ever came true because women aren't insects. Women live in history. Women change their minds. They get introduced to new ideas. They live in history. They're not part of something like a, a biological instinctual animal. Okay? So none of those projections ever came true. But what it did was it cemented in the American mind the idea of the danger of reproduction, particularly of Latinas, which continues until the present day. We just heard Trump's talks. We just heard Jeff Sessions' point. Ten years later, almost, immigration starts, a little bit more immigrants coming in. What happens? Invasion from Mexico. It just keeps growing. And you have, a, you have this kind of rhetoric going on in the public discourse. The word invasion becomes popular, not with our enemies, but with our friends across the border, of whom the leading trading partner of the United States is now our enemy. Because you don't use the word invade when you invite people to watch the Super Bowl. You invite your friends over. Invaders come in to take your land, destroy your way of life, and because we're a patriarchal society, steal your women. Look at this invasion. This magazine is telling you there's an invasion. Do you see camouflage? Do you see a gun? Do you see a tank? Do you see any accoutrement of the military? What do you see? You see brown people in water, so you know they're wetbacks. And you see a woman being carried across. What is she? The queen bee of reproduction. The Trojan horse of baby making. It's the most insidious invasion of all. They bring their women who are going to have babies, who create neighborhoods, who create communities, and they're going to want to take over the United States. This is a story that gets being told for the last 40 years. Some people call it the Reconquista, the Reconquest, just the invasion, the takeover. But it becomes the central narrative framing why the children of immigrants are such a problem. What happens in the 1980s? If you want to read this in much more detail, pick up my book, Covering Immigration, in a little bit less detail, but more focus on Latinos, the Latino threat. But basically, in the 1980s, we start seeing the discussion. It's, you know, it's, pretty, it's, it's going both ways. Not everybody was against immigration. Here you have a debate between president, a guy who's going to become president, the first George Bush, and another guy who's going to become president, Ronald Reagan. And they were asked, 
Do you think children of illegal aliens should attend schools for free? Or do you think their parents should pay? And George Bush answered first, and he said, we have made it illegal sometimes the labor we'd like to see legal. We're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law. And second, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. If they're living here, I don't want to see six and eight-year-old kids made totally uneducated. These are dreamers now he's talking about, okay? Made to feel they're living outside the law. These are good children, good people, strong people. So even in the midst of a pretty much nativist period, the two candidates for president of the United States were very positive on trying to integrate the children of immigrants. Just because they were undocumented doesn't mean we should discard them. Ronald Reagan said in 1984, before he signed the amnesty of 1986, I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and have lived here, even though sometime back they may have entered illegally. And he liked to make jokes how his grandfather from Tipperary, I think it was, was on a boat on the East Coast, saw America, jumped over, and became an illegal alien. And he said, you know, that's America, he said. And so he would say, and he said, I'm for giving people a break, right? Of course, we haven't seen too much of that discussion from the Republican Party for quite a while, it seems like. 1985, the year the Immigration Reform and Control Act was passed and came effective a year later, the debate around immigration was very fierce. And this came out on the cover of US News and World Report. I love the cover, very colorful. Remember, the colors of the American flag are red, white, and blue. And you see those colors dissipating or disappearing in the top of the picture, which means America's evaporating into the sunset. The colors of the Mexican flag are red and green. So you have what's left of the US, the white US letters, embedded in a field of green which is now the majority of what's that picture, which is Mexican. The red of the flag of the US, of the Mexican flag, which, in, which is borders with what's white of the US, is melted. And you have red purging itself into the United States, the blood of Mexico. And you, if you don't get it, there's little folkloric Mexicans, because they're never modern, like people here in engineering in this room at Harvard. They're backward people, uneducated people, peasants, right, coming north. And you have that. And they, if you don't get it, the picture tell me, tells me everything. And if you're not, you know, we, we need to be more, in a sense, better readers of images. But in case you aren't, it tells you in words. Will the Mexican migration create a new nation? Which means, are they going to come, have babies, create neighborhoods, take over the region, and ask for another nation, and separate? That's the question. That's why the children of immigrants are so dangerous. And if you think I'm making it up, here's what they wrote. Now sounds the march of the new conquistadors in the American Southwest. The heirs of Cortez and Coronado are rising again. Their movement is, despite its quiet and largely peaceful nature, that's how these children of immigrants are. It's peaceful until they take over. It's both an invasion and a revolt. At the vanguard of those born here, whose roots are generation deep, you see the discourse moves from immigrants. We all think immigration is the issue. It's not, it's the children of immigrants that are the issue, really, that the people are really concerned about. And this is really interesting to me. Why? Because for those of you who aren't historians, or people who study Mesoamerica, like our friend up here, you don't realize what they're telling you in this paranoid story. Cortez conquered the Aztecs 1519 to 1521. De veras, David, no. There you go. He was, he, he was there. <laughs> How long ago was that? 500 years? Coronado, two expeditions in New Mexico, in Texas, late, eight, late 1500s, early 1600s. We're talking about a four to 500 year conspiracy against the United States before there was a United States. That's how smart these people are. That's how smart they are. That's a, that's a national magazine telling you this. Now, my family came in the second expedition, early 1600s, to New Mexico. I'm 13th generation of people who've lived in the state of New Mexico when it was Spanish, when it was Mexican, and then when it was American. And if this was true, this 500, four to 500 year conspiracy against the United States, how come I never got a tweet or an email saying, tonight we kill white people? My family's been here that whole time. I'm being told. We've got a conspiracy, and yet there's no evidence for it. 
There's no pictures of Chicanos riding in the desert shooting M15s to learn how to take over this country. There's, but you hear this paranoid story being told to the American people about how it's generations of Latinos, particularly Mexican origin people, that you really have to worry about. Because it's their fertility. John Tanton, who got most of his money for starting Zero Population and the Federation for American Immigration Reform, but mainly right wing, relatively racist, and I take the word relatively in quotes, organizations, said very clearly, will the present majority peaceably hand over its political power to a group, Latin American immigrants, that is simply more fertile? On the demographic point, perhaps this is the first instance in which those with their pants up are going to get caught by those with their pants down. So I wear a belt really tight when I come give talks. So I don't want to be accused of anything. But you get the sense what's going on here. It's, immigration is really only the issue because they might have kids. Whether they're undocumented or legal or citizens, that's a problem. This is the image you get. And you can turn on TV tonight and watch any of the CSI shows, any of the crime shows. You're going to see basically women who have kids, a lot of kids, and they're no good mates over back there smoking their drugs, taking their wine, and getting women pregnant. Because that's the image they keep perpetuating. Once again, this is not true. I don't know if I have time to show it. You can look at my work. <coughs> Latina fertility is as lower and lower as anyone else's and going down all the time. Not having that many kids. The data just isn't there. When I started writing about that, no one believed me. Now everyone agrees. Everyone agrees now. I just got another letter from someplace else saying, you know, you were right. <laughs> Latinas aren't having that many kids. Not even teenagers. But this is the image. This is the problem. We can't have these people here. 1990s. 1990s immigration has extended to a certain point now, post-1965, where we opened, we got rid of the racist laws for immigration, opened up the whole world to everybody to come to the United States. We, then we had the fallout from the Korean War, the Southeast Asian Wars, the, war, the, the fact that we implanted a lot of dictators in Central America, the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union. All of a sudden, all kinds of people were coming to the United States. And the issue that becomes popular in the 1990s that people start focusing on is what does this demographic change mean? You see, they start telling us that whites are going to go from about 83% of the population to about less than half, perhaps, within the next few decades. Now, is this good or bad? Or is it just neutral? Is it just change? From an anthropological point of view, it's change. But from a political point of view, this could be a problem. This could be a major problem, right? What's, what's it? Now, I just remind you, warn you, California, I'm not sure about Massachusetts, California is way past this. We have, you know, we're, for example, my class, my students in UC Irvine are probably 25% white. The rest are minorities. So whites are a minority. And all the bad stuff you're going to see in a second, they were worried were going to happen, has never happened in California. Our campus, whites are treated really nice. We let a couple on our basketball team. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, you know, they have the whole swim team to themselves. I mean, I don't know what else they want. So it's, it's like, you know, volleyball a little bit. Now, so it's sort of like, I'm not sure what the problem people feared so much 20 years ago when demographic change became clear, but it was clear that there was a lot of problem because it's, anthropologists are always looking for words that frame a moment. A decade before this, it was compassion fatigue. We've had enough of those immigration, Southeast Asians, no more Cubans. 1990s, the browning of America becomes popular as a concept. Demographic change is not just neutral. It's not great that we're going to have now kimchi pizzas. Right? We're going to have sushi burritos, sushi burritos. We're going to have all these cool new things in the world. No, it's a danger. Hybridity, multiculturalism, demographic change is now becomes the browning of America. And it really gets epitomized in this image. 1990, probably the most racist image I'll show you. It didn't come from the KKK. It came from a national magazine called Time, if you've ever heard of it. I know nobody has magazines anymore. But look at this cover. It takes the symbol of America, the symbol of the nation, the people, and says, you know what? It's really a flag about white people. And it says, you know what? All those colors, it shows you that demographic little chart I showed you, it shows you whites are going to disappear from America. Look at the stars. Stars are white, aren't they, in the flag? They're gone. 
they're already being erased. Look at the white stripes. They're being squeezed out by the color black, the color brown, and the color yellow. Now, Ruben Rumbao, my mate in sociology, he says this reflects the, the pigment of our imagination, the way we use colors to talk about people. Black people, I assume, are Af people of African descent. Brown people, I'm assuming, are Latinos. I've never seen a yellow person, but I think they're Asians, right? Because we used to have the yellow threat. I think they're coming back in. So I get kind of upset here. Why? Because why do Asians get the biggest threat? Latinos should have the biggest threat. We're more of them. We're more of them, right? We're the ones supposed to have the reproductive problem. But why do Asians get the biggest threat? Well, the yellow threat. They're powerful economically, right? So I think we should reverse it. But just in case you think I'm joking you, this is a weekly magazine. In a week, it's gone. It's used for fodder somewhere, recycled. It was such an important idea to tell America, not if you're white, yellow, and brown in color, whatever that means, because you're the problem. But it was so important to tell the rest of America of this demographic change, they actually created something you don't really see, an advertisement that they sent to People magazine to tell people, if you're white, you better buy this magazine because we're warning you about the future. We're warning you about the future. Here's the, here's the, first of all, here's what they said. Then I'll show you the image. I don't have that little side thing here. So they wrote in the magazine, the browning of America will later will alter everything in society from politics and education to industry, values, and culture. White Americans are accustomed to thinking of themselves as the very picture of the nation. When the face of America changes, darkens, gets different kinds of features, people are going to react against that incredibly difficult, with difficulty, they thought. It's not going to be an easy transition. While no nothingism is generally confined to the more dismal corners of the American psyche, it seems all too predictable that during the next decades, which we're living in, many more mainstream white Americans will begin to speak openly about the nation they feel they are losing. That was the mantra of the recent campaign for presidency. That's the mantra. They predicted it. It's pretty, pretty good. I mean, they, they came up with this. Two decades later, it came true. This is the advertisement. A whole bunch of brown babies, maybe one black baby, maybe one Asian baby somewhere. But the problem is there's only one white baby. And it says on there, in case you missed the point and why you should buy the magazine, hey, Whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. Now, this isn't the Ku Klux Klan writing. This is Time magazine. Sometime soon, white Americans will become a distinct minority in a largely brown, cultural, and racial mix. I'm an anthropologist. We study culture. I didn't know it had color, but I guess it does. A sad story for many of our readers. Incredibly racist. As demographic change, what are they going to do to you if you're white? All these colors that are squeezing you out of the nation, the flag. You're going to be put in the back of the bus. Like I said, this hasn't happened in California. But people were afraid of that 20 years ago. And it works into political campaigns relatively, relatively nicely. It becomes fear. A taken for granted set of assumptions that America is changing in ways that threaten my very existence. Make America great again is what this image is about 20 years ago. Now, I see a lot of babies, but I don't see a lot of power, right? I just don't see, you know, for me, you can't just have demographic pay, change. You really got to have some, some power attached to those babies. When we have a mariachi in the White House, you know, then I'll think we have some that demographic power. And that means when Latinos learn how to vote, right? When they get citizenship, when they're allowed citizenship. You know, you, they, and they tell you, we should let DACA come and be in existence, but we don't want them to be citizens for 15 to 20, 25, 30, 40, 50. We don't ever want them to vote, basically. We don't ever want them to vote to enjoy the franchise of being a citizen. Why? Because you might get a mariachi in the White House. Because all, all DACA people and dreamers love mariachi, right? I have no idea. I, some are Korean, aren't they? 1991, we start seeing the first bills put into Congress to get rid of the constitutional amendment that guarantees citizenship through birth, the 14th Amendment. California, unfortunately, was the representative from California, Elton Gallagher, conservative, who introduced the bill. So we're, we're leading the charge. The bottom line, he said, when you look at the cost for childbirth for children, for babies of illegal immigrants, and for payments to them afterward, is that all the other needy children are being deprived. 
us and them. We give them something that takes away from our children. And despite the fact, right, that these are citizen kids he's talking about who are not our children. Somehow, they're separate from our children. This later becomes the anchor baby image. But right now, it's still, it hasn't come into play yet. So they're trying to figure out in the political rhetoric, how do we separate them from the herd? How do we make them appear as if they're distinctives as citizens? So you can, and once you can do that, as we'll see, you can do a lot of stuff. You can do a lot of stuff once you do that. Once you create a discourse around difference for people who really are the same. They're citizens. We can see that in California, 1994, when we had Proposition 187. It really wasn't about immigrants working. It was an anti-immigrant bill. It was nothing about immigrants not working. It was about their kids. It was about social and biological reproduction, not economic work. It was about providing services for the women who are pregnant, their postnatal care, and their kids getting educations. They come here, they have their babies, and after that, they become citizens. And all those children use social services, despite the fact they're citizens who have as much right to use it as anyone else. So what happens in the 2000s? Well, people start really talking about this problem with the kids. This is the cover of a magazine some of you may know called The American Enterprise, relatively conservative. And you'll see two images. One's called The Problem, and one is The Solution. The problem is the children of immigrants are what? Gang members. Have we heard anything lately about MS-13 constantly in the news? If we could just get rid of them, we could have kids like this, the ones who sit around at the park reading SAT books. And none of them, and none of them, and none of them are Latinos. Because Latinos, A, can't read, B, can't read English, and C, don't care about college. I wish it was funny, because I laugh at it too. But that's the idea. Get rid of Latinos and their kids, especially their, their, their criminal kids, and what a great place America would be. And you have a lot of articles in there about that problem. What you have basically is a call for changing the demographics back to when America was great again. And you can go on Gibson, you can go on the internet, YouTube, and find tons and tons and tons of people talking about. In fact, they even, they're very positive sometimes. Latinas have done their job, they've had their babies. White women, you gotta go out and have babies. We, we can't just let them have babies. I mean, it's, 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 the maternity ward has turned into the new ground zero of immigration politics. It's Nagasaki. It's Hiroshima in those birth rooms. That's where the war is. That's where it's taking place. And I, I, I don't have time to go through all this. I'm just gonna, this is just one image. I could, I could spend a whole hour here just on these images on TV. So the issue that's raised is, what do we do with the children of undocumented immigrants? You guys know DACA. You know the Dreamers. I'm not going to do too much on that. You know the fact that, that they have a lot of problems because they were brought here as a young age. They were raised here. We educate people who come here because the, the Supreme Court decision says we should because it would make no sense to have people who are uneducated running around our cities and our streets. But before DACA, my students could come and get educated. We'd invest in their education, but they couldn't work. They couldn't work. It was the stupidest, most contradictory thing. And to go to school in America your whole life, being paid by, by taxpayers to support you to get your education, and then when it's time, like my kids, to go back to work to pay back society, we wouldn't let them? What kind of cockamamie contradiction is that? So DACA helped that by allowing people to work. We stigmatize the kids by giving them a name like illegal. In the old days, when I was growing up, wetback, right? To make sure that people understood these kids aren't like your kids or my kids, right? They're stigmatized kids. So we allow them to attend school before DACA, but not work legally. And if they did work, they'd have to do work under the cover, under for cash doing the worst jobs imaginable with a BA, or MA, sometimes even PhDs, because they couldn't work until like DACA. And what do we do? We dangle the hope of legalization. We give them DACA, and, which isn't a secure, as we know, see now, a secure solution for anything. We dangle the DREAM Act. You know what that's like? That's like in the French Revolution, 
taking a prince or the king's son, putting him in the guillotine, and pulling him out of the guillotine. Put him in the guillotine. Oh, we're going to pass it this week. Everyone's all happy. Oh, no, we couldn't agree. Pull it back out of the guillotine again. You don't know when your head's going to get chopped off. You just know it's coming. Hopefully, they'll dismantle it, and it won't happen. They'll give them some sort of secure chain. But right now, you don't know that. Can you imagine the stress of being put in the guillotine for every political whim and battle that Washington wants to go through? I'm not DACA. I'm not a dreamer. But it would make me sick to have to go through that, physically sick to do that. And then we subject them to deportation. As we see now, anybody can be deported, even if you're a legal immigrant. You went through the whole process and you got legal status. Or you're a refugee who got legal status, like my students studying Cambodians in Long Beach right now. They thought they were home free. Refugees who became green card holders. They thought they were citizens and never deportable. They got arrested for drunk driving. They're back in Cambodia, don't speak the language, weren't even born there, they were born in a camp, and now they're, they're stateless. Deportation has become an open-ended question now. Birthright citizenship would like to get rid of that security of citizenship for children born here and make them deportable. That's the whole issue. Damn, they're citizens. It's hard to deport them. Well, what if we get rid of birthright citizenship? Wouldn't that make it a lot easier for us? Wouldn't that be interesting? So DACA, I'm not going to go too much into it. That's us make one point. A lot of my students, not too long ago, I wrote my book, Shadow Lives, because nobody wanted to come out of the shadows. It was hard to come out of the shadows. It was difficult. Your life was constantly being surveyed. These kids, so strong. I even wrote, you're taking a huge chance. You're giving information. Who knows what's going to happen in the next administration? And now we know. It's a huge risk. But they said, we're undocumented and unafraid. What does the administration and the director of ICE now say, quote, unquote, they should be afraid. They should be back in the shadows. We don't want to see them. It's interesting. I'm not going to go too much more on them, because I really want to focus on their brothers and sisters who are citizens, who have become known as anchor babies. Anchor baby didn't always exist as a term. I did a whole search. I mainly focused on the New York Times and LA Times to find out when this term came into being. It, it starts, it pops up a little bit in the, in the early 2000s. Because remember, you'll see it here. Red is New York Times, birthright citizenship, and, and um, uh, uh, let me see, LA Times is blue. And so it really starts, there's a little bit, let me see, Anchor Babies is actually purple. Right here for the LA Times, you see it, 2001. And then for New York Times, it's green. It doesn't happen for another five years in the New York Times. So it comes out first as an idea in California, and then the New York Times starts picking it up just a few shortly afterwards. Go ahead. Uh, after, way after, way after, a decade after. 9-11, well, 2011, OK. And so what you have here, I'm sorry, sorry, I was thinking about 1991. 2000, 2011, 2001, you start seeing the first instances in LA. Because, and we'll see it in a second, terrorism is an angle. And these children could be terrorists, right? These babies. And we'll come back to that. And so it starts popping up in the early 2000s, becomes really big after 2006. And 2011, particularly with the election campaign, goes what I call basically nuclear, right? What Anchor Baby does, it demonizes an idea that's part of our tradition, that's part of our law and a part of the way many people who came to this country, their kids became Americans. And that's birthright citizenship. So birthright citizenship doesn't sound so bad. right? It means you were born on American soil. Therefore, you're part of our nation. You have a birthright to be here. But how do you separate a group from the herd with the word like name, uh, the concept like that, that applies to everybody? We have to come up with another term. You have to come up with another term. And that's where Anchor Baby fit into the political discourse. It said, they're all citizens, but we can separate this group of citizens out by giving them another name so they don't appear really to be in this group anymore. And we can attach, as we'll see, a whole bunch of characteristics to that new term. 
So anchor babies emerges as a pejorative term for US born citizens whose parents happen to be undocumented. Is this a problem? So what? Well, it became a problem in the political discourse because anchor babies weren't just like other citizens. If those are the anchor babies over there, we separated them out because they aren't like you. They're here as part of a plot. They're here as part of a conspiracy. Their parents had them to help their parents get legal status. So they don't, they, didn't, they aren't here because they love America, or want to contribute to America, or become part of America. They're here to take advantage of America. They're citizens, but they're not real citizens like the rest of us. Right? They become suspect citizens because they're part of a conspiracy. So the anchor babies become constructed as a concept. And for those of you like Michel Foucault, which I happen to like, it's right out of his playbook. How do you create a concept that creates a subject position which now becomes the object of knowledge and discourse formation? Well, that's exactly what happens, right? Take, the, take this analysis of hysteria and just substitute the word anchor baby. It's going to be very similar, right? Now, why is it important to, to do this to citizens? Because if you want to treat people differently, you've got to separate from the herd in some way that everyone recognizes that they are different. Germany, you had Jews who were citizens. How are you going to put them in gas chambers unless you construct them as not real citizens, a threat to the real citizens, not real Germans? You've got to separate from the herd those whom you wish to control, pursue laws about. You have to separate them out. Otherwise, they'd apply to all of you. They apply to all of us as citizens, but they don't. We're talking about this group of people who are so much different. So we, by this term that starts emerging in the early 2000s creates a new subject status called the anchor babies. They're defined as different from other citizens very clearly, and we can create a whole a lot of information. Because once you have a term like anchor baby or hysteria or toenail fungus or whatever term you want to construct in a discourse, it becomes very productive. And how has it become productive? Well, you can create laws, right? You can create ways of attaching attributes to the people you put into this category of people. You can create knowledge about this category of people. Until there was hysteria, you didn't have knowledge about women. And the word hysteria comes from here is erectomy, right? These are women who are hysterical mostly. So now you have the word hysteria, you can create knowledge about women who are hysterical and prone to it. Now you have anchor babies, you can create knowledge, which our university, your university, engages in because it's productive. And, you know, that's what we do as scholars. So we can create terms that define them as different. We can collect data on the supposedly different group of people that will influence policy influence classes, influence the way we think about this separate group of people. For example, we know now that there are, because now we have a term we can use to figure this out. We have 4.1 million U.S. children under age 18 living with at least one undocumented parent between 2009 and 2013. Why would we care about that? Oh, because they're anchor babies. Why would we care? They're citizens. Because now we have a term called anchor baby we need data on. We, have a, we can collect data on the children born in the United States to undocumented immigrants between 1980 and 2014 and see how much they've increased over the years, when they peaked, how it's going down. Number of babies born to unauthorized immigrants continues to, to decline. Pass along, why do we care? They're citizens of the United States. Oh, yeah. They're anchor babies. Let's, collect, let's create data because we, now we need some policies, perhaps. We need to do something about it. Should they even be citizens? as Trump says. How do you answer those questions without now data on this new category of citizens? We can assign people to those anchor babies categories, right? So if your parent, one or two parents are undocumented, boom, you're automatically separated out from the herd. You're in that pen over there. You're a citizen, but not quite. And we can impose a set of characteristics on them, to distinguish them from us. They're cheaters, they're conspirators, they're un-American, because they don't love America, they're here to take advantage of us, and they're undeserving citizens who don't really deserve our investment in their education, their welfare, their health care. Because really, they're not really of us. They're separate from us, really. We just saw how many there were, right? 
ultimately they're really a threat to the nation. Because since they don't want to be of us, they don't want to learn like us, our language, they don't want to associate with us, they don't want to intermarry with us, they just got their, want to get their parents to create more people like them here, they're a threat to the nation. The browning of America, everything you can think of becomes associated with this group of people. They're Sussex citizens, and it now becomes easy because you have data, you have characteristics, you separated them from the herd, and now you can say, are they really citizens? A lot of people tell me they don't think so. A lot of people, you can question their citizenship. You can pretend they're not like citizens like the rest of us. You can create policies or suggest policies like the one I just showed you that have been in Congress every year since 1991 to deny them citizenship because this is now a problem that we constructed. That wasn't a problem until we created the term. So now we have a bunch of bills, as we're going to see in a second, to end birthright citizenship. It's become a normal thing to introduce those into Congress, to get rid of the, the anchor babies. 2001, when the terms start first coming up, Glenn Spencer, one of the founders of the anti-immigrant movement, warns of the Reconquista. Now all Mexican has to do is have a baby, and she and her boyfriend are set for life, scavenging for work on street corners, selling dope to U.S. teenagers, helps supplement free giveaways from the Yankee suckers. It's amazing. It's amazing. Are you DACA in here? So can you get me some dope? It's, uh, or You got any free giveaways today? I mean, what'd you get today? Anything good? I mean, you got a book from us. Huh? There you go. See, you're sucking the life out of us. From Roberto, not me. It's just, but the idea is that, like I just said, they're a threat to America because of these characteristics that we take for granted that they have, right? Then you have the South Koreans and the Chinese. At the same time, birth tourism comes into popular image, which continues today. Very few, really, legally here, can afford to have a really nice vacation and have a baby, <laughs> right? They're lumped into the same thing, even though the numbers are really smaller. And the whole idea then is that these birth tourism creates anchor babies for people who want to take advantage of America. So it just adds to the rhetoric. I have to admit, a good friend of mine, Jorge Carrillo, sociologist, for those of you who are sociologists, Mexico, we worked together on my first book, he worked with me. He's a famous sociologist in Mexico on, on different things, auto industry, actually in NAFTA. And he had two daughters. The second daughter was born in San Diego. You know, they were able to cross over. And I said, Jorge, why, did, why was Paloma born in, in San, University Hospital in San Diego? And he goes, Leoncito. He always calls me, they call me Leoncito often in Mexico. Little lion. And he goes, because I always wanted a daughter with blue eyes. And I go, okay. But, <laughs> but, but her, eyes, her eyes are brown, Jorge. And he goes, oh, it didn't work. Okay, so anyway. So some people come to the United States. It's not that it doesn't happen. The issue is, why is it so bad? Tell you the truth. Uh, Barbara Coe, 2003, when this idea comes up, she starts calling the kids in Orange County who are born with parents who are undocumented immigrants anchor babies. Because they're born here, they end up funding the needs for the entire illegal alien family. It's a tremendous welcome mat for illegal aliens. You'll notice the, the current proposal that if somebody who's an undocumented family has a U.S. born child who gets free lunch, any sort of aid, that every citizen deserves can be deported for taking advantage of the United States, even though their child, as a citizen, has every right to any of those products as anyone else who's a citizen. But now they're suspect cheaters, and their family can suffer and be deported for it, even if they've done nothing wrong their whole lives here. They pay taxes. They, can, they want to make them deportable because a U.S.-born child received the kind of benefit they deserve. That's amazing to me. That's what this is all about. Now, one of the first people to actually promote this idea was Michelle Malkin. And she wrote a book. She's a media pundit. She's on Fox News, where else? And, you know, publishes books on this topic, has her own blog you guys can get on. In 2004, when the idea starts coming up, she starts popularizing the anchor baby idea. And she says, doing my book tour across the country for invasion, guess who's invading? And uh, this issue of anchor babies comes up time and again. In the Southwest, everyone has a story of a heavily pregnant woman crossing the, the Mexican border to deliver their anchor babies. And, the, the, and of course, there's the terrorism angle. Because those babies, 
Now, I've had, I've had two babies. I've changed a lot of diapers. There's a lot of bombs in those diapers, but I've never seen a bomb bomb in those diapers because the whole idea is absurd. You're going to have a baby just to turn the baby into a terrorist who's going to explode on American culture. It's just <laughs> where people come up with these ideas, I have no idea. But she helped popularize the idea because the idea is fresh now. People need to put it on the TV. They, in 2005, 2009, I call it the period in which Anchor Babies ca captures the public imagination. And it does this, and here's like the cover of my talk, actually a little thing. I like the idea, mainly because a lot of men don't know how babies are born. This is how they're basically come to the United States. They're like storks bring the babies and, and drop them off across the border. This kind of imagery becomes very popular, right? That they're being brought and dropped, right? Lou Dobbs, for those of you who know him, when he was on CNN, almost every single day he spoke about babies and immigration. He really, if, if, if Malkin introduced the idea, she didn't have anywhere near the ability to spread it as much as Lou Dobbs. He, for him, it became a rallying cry. And he, he's a pretty funny guy, actually, I have to admit. I and mean, he, he called the U.S.-Mexico border the birth canal. Kind of funny, right? And uh, how they come here to have babies. They, they get a slew of federal, state, and local benefits because those babies are now citizens, once again. And they can sponsor their parents once they turn 21, which is very difficult to do. I mean, to sponsor someone, even your own parent, you have to sign a paper saying if they get anything cost the United States for five years, you'll pay. Which means if they get hit by a hit and run driver, wind up in the hospital with a hundred thousand dollar bill in the emergency room, you're paying for it. It's hard to get people to sponsor. You have to be pretty well off to sponsor, to tell you the truth, and to really sign those papers. Lindsey Graham, 2010, said people come here to have babies. They come here to drop a child. It's called drop and leave. To have a child in America, they cross the border, they go to the emergency room, they have a child, that's a, and that child's automatically an American citizen. This, that shouldn't be the case. That attracts, attracts people for all the wrong reasons. You see the narrative now. It starts off 10 years, you know, a little earlier, little bits and pieces, but the, the, the narrative is forming in your eyes. It's concretizing into a clear set of positions that get repeated over and over. The word propaganda comes to mind. You say something stupid and, and wrong, and many, as much as you can, pretty soon people believe it. That's all we're talking about here, right? That's all we're talking about. The imagery that goes with his comment, squat and drop became the imagery, that you have this woman at the border, her, of course, her husband, who's a drunkard, who doesn't work, right, who impregnated her, who may not even be her husband, and, you know, they come here to drop a child. Now, this is really interesting. Why? Because I'm an English speaker. I don't think I've ever said in my whole life that a woman drops her baby. My wife had two kids. She delivered two children. But if you watch TV, I don't know if you grow up on a farm, but if a horse has a foal, what do you call it? The horse dropped its foal. The cat's dropped its litter. To use the word drop in relationship to reproduction is to put it into an animal metaphor immediately. It reduces the process of reproduction to an animal process, not a human process, okay? But we've done that before. Turning immigrants into animals is a great rhetorical device to put them into a subhuman category. And then once they're subhuman, it's easier to treat them inhumanely. This is the early, you know, when Europeans were coming, when I showed you those quotes, direct from Europe, the slums of Europe daily, and they're, they're rats. They're vermin coming here to wreak havoc on America, right? <laughs> Pass laws to get rid of them. The origin quotas, right? Because they're not really like other people who are here. They're bringing disease. They're bringing anarchy. They're bringing mafia. They're bringing all kinds of negative things, right? They're rats. Europeans are rats. So it's very similar to, to me, metaphorical. It's the same metaphorical device to reduce immigrants and the children into something less than human. 2011, 2015, Anchor Babies goes viral. Much of it to do with the election. This is really funny. If you haven't read my book, then you should, this is funny to me. So what happens? When you have new words, the dictionary wants to put those words in the dictionary. So they said, oh my God, people are using this term Anchor Baby. So they, the fifth edition that came out November 1st, 2011, I popped it up, I saw it, and I said, wait a minute, what's this? A child, it's a noun, a child born to a non-citizen mother in a country that grants automatic citizenship to children born on its soil, especially such a child born to parents seeking to secure eventual status for themselves and often other members of their family. The story was told so much, so often, and so loudly, the dictionary thought it was true. 
the criticisms were so swift, they actually, you can't find that in the, in the internet now, because they changed it. They said, oops, sorry. It's part of a political rhetoric, not truth. It's an offensive term, disparaging a child, a non-citizen from a non-citizen mother. They, they said, sorry, we thought it was real. We didn't realize this was made up, right? And used to actually undermine people's sense of belonging, their, 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 their question their citizenship, and make them feel like somehow we can treat them differently from everyone else. So they, they wised up pretty quickly. It took about a month, I think, to get the new one on. So Trump, though, picks up on all this. He didn't invent this. That's the whole point. Trump is not a creative guy, I guess. I don't know. He just goes back and sees stuff, pulls the, the low-hanging fruit off the tree, and, and uses it, right? And so the 14th Amendment became an issue. Number one, the 14th Amendment is very questionable as to whether or not someone can come over here and have a baby, and immediately that baby is a citizen. Many lawyers agree with many. They do not have, they do not have U.S. citizenship. His solution in his campaign, and continues, which is deport. Latinos love their family so much, we don't have to separate them, deport them all. <laughs> Let them take their US citizen kids with them. That's no problem, keep them together. We gotta keep families together because we think family is really important. Just deport them all. In birthright citizenship was his major solution. Then we won't have the problem. So you have bills in Congress, as I mentioned, starting in the 1990s, to get rid of birthright citizenship. It keeps coming up over and over. I love this one because in, in, I like the picture. In 2011, Steve King from Iowa, on the first day of, the, of that Congress, carries in a whole stack of his bill to get rid of birthright citizenship. I just love it because it looks like a Greek god, Titan, carrying the world on his shoulders. Look up this bill he put in. It's one page long. It only needs to be this much of them. Why he has to carry so much? Because it wouldn't look good if he wasn't carrying the world on his shoulders, right? He's, he's saving the world from these People who really shouldn't be Americans, shouldn't be citizens. Oh, five minutes, shit. Excuse me. So Steve King has, we just as soon as, uh, soon as the new president was, was sworn in, he put in another bill to get rid of birthright citizenship. Right? Has 22 sponsors. And he says, basically, why is he so concerned about the 14th Amendment? He says, because we need to address anchor babies. That isn't what our founding fathers intended. And I ask, really? Did he channel them? How does he know that? Why does he think they'd be so against anchor babies? Where's the evidence for that? And first of all, we fought a war against England called the Revolutionary War that had a declaration of independence that was nothing but a series of reasons why we're pissed off at King George. And one of them was because he wouldn't allow us to have enough immigration. So the same people would be against children who become citizens? I don't know, hard to imagine. But he's, basically the problem in the fort is that they don't like the 14th Amendment because it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. Basic little idea, basic idea. Those who want to get rid of the 14th Amendment focus on that idea subject to the jurisdiction thereof. And they argue the children of undocumented immigrants are not included in this definition because their parents being undocumented are not under the jurisdiction of the United States. Now, I know I have a couple minutes, but I really, it's really important to get to the origin of myths about the 14th Amendment and immigrant children. English law that we inherited when we were colonies had the idea that a king and his territory had people living in it, and if they were born in the territory of the king, they were natural born subjects of the king. To be a, an American president, you have to be a natural born citizen. That's where we got the term. You have to be born in the United States territory, right, to be a president of the United States. The US Constitution doesn't, doesn't really talk too much about this issue if you want to know the truth. It does talk about the president, but really doesn't define citizenship so much. But not everyone at the time was given full citizenship status. African-American slaves, not citizens. Native Americans, not citizens. They were said to live on their own independently territories as if they were French, they were Cherokee, that's their own country. Non-whites who couldn't naturalize, really couldn't become citizens, right? Chinese. You couldn't, you couldn't become, if you're non-white, you couldn't become a citizen, right? So the issue at the time, when you had the 14th Amendment, during the Civil War particularly, 
clarified that African Americans, no matter what their parents' status as slaves or themselves, are American citizens like everyone else. That was the purpose of the 14th Amendment. They were born into the nation. The word nation comes from the root word nasser, which is to be born. That's all nation means. You're born into that nation. Right? So the, the Supreme Court, so the 14th Amendment clarified that, but it left out, from some people's minds, what about other people? What about the children of immigrants? especially non-white immigrants, especially those barred from citizenship, like the Chinese. Can someone whose parents are not capable of ever becoming a citizen actually be a citizen if their parents are their parents? <laughs> Wong Kim Ark, born in California, left California to visit his parents and went back to China, went back to visit them, came back, they wouldn't let him in the country. They said, you're not a citizen, because I was born in California doesn't matter, you're not a citizen. Your parents are Chinese, they were excludable, you can't come in. So the Supreme Court takes up this case in 1898. And this is, this is, I bring this up, this is the most important case, I think, for why the children of undocumented immigrants are citizens. It doesn't matter, because the Supreme Court was very clear on this. In 1898, Justice Horace Gray wrote the decision for the Supreme Court, and he was very clear, he said, Citing some earlier law, natives are all persons born within the jurisdiction and allegiance of the United States. This is the rule of the common law without any regard or reference to the political condition or allegiance of their parents, except for diplomats. That's a separate issue. With the exception of children born to ambassadors, yeah, he just said it, who are in theory born with the allegiance of the foreign power they represent. It can hardly be denied that an alien is completely subject to the political jurisdiction of the country in which he resides. You can't, if you're living here, you can't run a red light. You can't kill somebody, right? You can't shoplift. Those are the laws you have to live under. You live under the jurisdiction of our laws. Residents of foreign birth living in the United States and mingling indiscriminately with its inhabitants for the purposes of business or pleasure are never exempt from the jurisdiction of the laws of the country while in the country they owe allegiance to the country and those laws. So the Supreme Court said in 1898, the children born in the US is a citizen regardless of his parents' political status. It does not matter. It does not matter. And of course, that has implications for the children of undocumented immigrants. The law states very clearly, I don't know who Trump's lawyers are, but he's not paying them enough, getting new lawyers, because the law is very clear. Anybody can go out and, 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 and see what it's doing. But by even bringing up the term, it doesn't matter what the law says. You've accomplished a lot. You've undermined people's sense of belonging by separating them from the herd, claiming they're not real citizens. You're giving people a license to think they aren't real citizens and treat them differently. It's okay to call them names, to chastise them. You see them buying food at the grocery store to say, hey, are you an anchor baby? To sing God bless America if they're playing a basketball game at your high school because you claim they aren't real Americans like you? It gives that legitimacy to these kinds of behaviors in America. It's a tell, okay to tell people to go home, even though the United States is their home. So it, it doesn't matter what the law says, creating this subject position already does a lot. And some people even go further. In 2010 in Florida, they begin treating all anchor babies, as they call them, as non-citizens. They started charging them foreign student tuition as if they just came from Mother Did, rather than growing up as citizens in the United States. In Texas, somebody got it in their head that their parents need to prove why they're here, or we're not going to give birth certificates to any children born in Texas, unless their parents can prove their residence. And so these kids are being born by the hundreds, if not thousands, with no birth certificates. And what happens if you're picked up and the, and the ICE says, where's this baby from? Well, he was born down at the hospital. Where's your birth certificate? They didn't give me one. Get out of here. How are you going to prove your kid is an American citizen? Of course, the lawsuit came, and they, they finally won. But there's all kinds of things that are happening. I just, I'll skip all this. I don't have too much time. But just one thing is that Michelle Malkin, who, who argues against anchor babies, herself is an anchor baby. Her parents were from the Philippines here on, on, on a student visa when she was born. By her own definition, she should not be a citizen of the United States. Sometimes the law should work in good ways. I don't know. I just want to touch, as I finish on my new research, just real quickly, because I did a project looking at 
this words that people use about people, can they hurt you? I joined up with a psychologist. We had a bunch of students like you come in, and we, I, I showed them different kinds of stimulus. And then I asked them what they thought about positive, negative, and neutral images about immigration. And it's very clear, just real quickly, that when you say words will never hurt me, you're wrong. Words can have really strong impact on your sense of well-being, your mental health, and the way you see the world. And, and, and so we looked at this issue, and we had 290 students come in. I wasn't there, had a student had them look at stuff, and then ask them standard psychological questions. And I got the idea because in the soul of black folk, W.E. Du Bois says, starts off, first page, what does it mean to be a problem? What's it mean to be black in America when people talk about you certain ways? Give you characteristics that you know aren't you. What does that do to you, your psyche? And I said, yeah, what does that do? Let's test that. Let's test that in a lab and see what happens. And so I did that. We had 285 students, showed them images, asked them with their responses, asked them to respond to classic questions about stress, about affect, about all kinds of things. And just to kind of show you real quickly as I finished, that how when you talk mean about people in ways they don't recognize themselves, it can really have an impact. It can really hurt. When people were shown the negative imagery that I, I had and the quotes, and then asked them what do they think about it, what do they feel, they continually and consistently used words like, and this is what they're writing. I'm not giving them these words. We did later give them words. Sad, upset, hurt, offended. They feel bad. Right? Here's a quote. Anger, this woman's Mexican-American woman wrote, anger, rage, frustration, impotence are just some of the words that come to mind. But I have so much to say that I'm, I'm not able to properly articulate. She gets choked. I can't articulate what I'm trying to say, much less express myself in a healthy manner. These types of regressions are not new to me, so I know what it's like to have those words and images being shouted at you, make you feel out of place, ashamed and inferior, even though you were born in the United States. The stress indexes, after we show them this rhetoric that's popular in the imagery, in the political process, on TV, goes way up, significantly up, compared to those who viewed positive rhetoric. Words can hurt, but if you say positive things, it can have a salubrious effect. It can be healthy. People respond in ways that makes them feel good. So when we show them positive things about immigrants and, 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 and uh, these are all Latino, actually Mexican origin people, actually, because that's what the rhetoric was mainly about. They used words in their, and we didn't give them these words, we did later. The words they used to describe their feelings and their response to the images were, and, and rhetoric were proud, they feel happy, they're talking about the benefit that they give to society, they feel empowered because they recognize the positive contributions they make, and they have a sense of community because the images are giving them that sense of community with the larger society. So what we say about people is really important to think that somehow our words don't matter that we can have a president who chastises people and call them rapists and murderers is somehow going to be walk off, wash off their back as if, oh yeah, that's okay, that's cool, that's cool. It's just, it's just not going to happen. When you show positive people things, they say things like, you know, I feel things like this. You know, as a Mexican-American, I feel proud reading the quotes and seeing the images. I feel very emotional because in the present day, individuals discriminate not only against immigrants, but their children. I'm glad to see that we are contributing to society, and I wish Americans could see that. I wish they can see we are not harming their country, in quotes. We are helping it grow. What's interesting is that we were fortunate to have people who we interviewed before and after Trump got elected, none of us thought he would, so we were able to compare them, and it's very clear when you look at the stress after the election compared to before, significantly different stresses went way up for these kids after the election, because they felt they were now targets by the President of the United States was the very person saying these bad things about them. It's very interesting, right? So conclusion, just to get out and leave you, is that, you know, I hope we're too smart to get rid of the 14th Amendment. It would really be crazy to create a whole bunch of people who are deportable after being born in the United States, who are so excludable and feel like they don't belong even though they're born in the United States. But that's the goal of some people, to make deportable everybody they think somehow doesn't fit in. So thank you very much. Too long? We do have time for questions. Um, people have questions for Professor Chavez. You don't have to believe anything I said. We've got mics. 
Are there any anchor babies in the house? Only one admitted to it. <laughs> Trump's an anchor baby. His mother's immigrant. You don't have a question, Roberta? Hi. Um, I had a question about whether about another stereotype that I'm wondering whether you see or have seen any overlap um, that dates back a little earlier than Anchor Babies, and that's the 80s idea of the welfare queen and of um, other groups of non-white women having children and then being perceived as sort of looking for handouts via childbirth. Um, I'm wondering if in your research there was any overlap between that sort of rhetoric um, and the post-2001 anchor baby rhetoric that you saw or that you would yeah, no, speculate uh, about? They're cousins. They're part of the same overall rhetoric to undermine the sense of belonging of, of women of color and their reproductive contribution to America is seen as negative. It's, no surprise, it's not surprising that our governor in the early 19, 1990s, Governor Pete Wilson, on his first campaign, campaigned against African-American mothers who he called, in essence, welfare queens. They're having babies, that we're supporting those babies, we should limit the number of babies we'll support. He became governor. Four years later, he ran on a campaign of Mexican women's reproduction. So it's, it's really part, for me, part and parcel of the same set of issues of who deserves to have babies in America and how you can stigmatize whole groups of women based upon a set of assumptions and I think ideas about whether or not they're real Americans and, and should be contributing. And it really goes back to a certain extent, back to the, what I showed you at the beginning, ideas of eugenics. Ideas of eugenics, who deserves to have babies? Whose babies do we deserve to support? Who should we invest in? And those are, you know, those ideas somehow, and this whole discussion we're going to be talking about right now, getting well, rid of welfare, child assistance, I mean, all these things that daycare, all these things they're talking about is really that issue. I, I don't see them as separate. I see them really on the same, they're cousins, same continuum of ideas, right? So I hope that answers your question. I write about that in my book, actually. Uh-oh. Someone here have one, too, I think. You're not going to get on the, they want to have you on the tape. I just wanted you to say whether you think there's a relationship between the growing anti-abortion movement and the move to have more babies, white babies. Any well, kind of baby. yeah, I think uh, a lot of countries in the industrialized world are suffering not too much from too many babies, but from under having too few babies. And you know, a lot of countries that need more people, like you could take any European country, for example, uh, they have really extremely low fertility. In fact, if, if you guys were in high school here in, in some places like Germany and Denmark, you'd be, you'd be giving suggestions on not how not to have babies, but to have more babies. And so the mantra in, in the 60s was, you know, recreate, but don't procreate. In a lot of countries with low fertility, they say procreate and recreate. And it's mainly because there's a fear because of the, you know, what, what, creates, what creates a demand for labor? High, low fertility rates, aging populations, and a demand for labor because we're, ca we're capitalists. We create jobs. We want jobs. Under those conditions, almost all the countries in Europe and other places, Japan, for example, too, have immigration because of that demand for labor. But it's not the immigration they want. And so try, they, try and, they create all kinds of government assistance to get women to have more babies. So, and, but they, they, cause they, they don't want the people from North Africa to out-reproduce them. They don't want the Muslims to out-reproduce them. Right? They want to have Europe look like Europe still, but it's not, it's not going to happen, really, because uh, the immigration is already moving so fast. And some of the people talk about demographic winters in those countries that, that they show in 40, 50 years. They need as many people coming as immigrants as exist in those countries today, given the fertility rates, if they want to exist as countries. You're going to have a change in the color of, those, of the complexion of those countries. So yeah, I think there is, there is a push to, to, to reduce um, uh, access to ab abortion, particularly for women who they feel should be reproducing. Not for others. Maybe give them as many abortions as possible. I have no idea. Okay. Just to follow up on that same 
line of discussion, I was wondering if you could say a few words about uh, a story that I think is uh, seldom discussed, which is the sort of history of forced sterilization oh, yeah, sure. of women of color in this country and in yeah. Puerto Rico, Mexican-American women in California, sure. et cetera. Well, that's a whole discussion in itself, but it has, it's basically around the same root set of characterizations. And she's asking about the fact that the United States has had a long history of eugenics, uh, which has resulted in policies in various states and places have, where women were sterilized, often against their will. Uh, sometimes it was in um, uh, places where the mentally ill were kept, and they thought, you, don't, you, know, how, you don't want to weaken the breed, that kind of mentality. And that went on in many places until the 60s, actually. And then with immigrant women, this whole rhetoric that somehow they're coming and having babies resulted in a lot of immigrant women being asked to sign in maternity rooms as they were delivering their child this form. And they thought they were just signing to get you know, a baby born. And it turned out they were, they were giving agreement to have their tubes tied. And they didn't know until they would try to have another baby. My friend Carlos Velez Ibanez, who's at the University of Arizona, Arizona State, actually did a lot, number of interviews on this. Uh, Iris did it a lot in, in Puerto Rico. And he testified in, in court cases for, on these women that he interviewed. It's extremely sad cases, right? Because it's one thing to know, but never to know until you want to have a child that you can never have a child because what they did to you. I mean, it's tragic. And it's, but it's all around this rhetoric. I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's not apart from this rhetoric. It's embedded in it. And, uh, and it goes back to what Dorothy Roberts talks about, a lot about, you know, who do we think should be having babies? I think Roberto should have them, but he doesn't want to. Go ahead. You know, in terms of the research we've done, by the way, in terms of low fertility among Latinas in general, our interviews with, in California at least, among Asian, the children of Asian immigrants, their fertility is slow, so low, I don't know how they're ever going to reproduce the Asian American communities. Extremely low. If, if Latinas, the children of Latina immigrants is down to about 1. I think probably 1.4 maybe, 1.3, 1.4 per woman. Asian American women of the same age categories are like 0.6. So that's, that's really, it affects different people in different ways, in different groups, right? It's really interesting. But generally, low fertility among all women at this point. How many, how many women in here have 10 kids? You don't love America? We wouldn't need any immigration if everyone had 10 kids. My mother's family had 10 kids, 11 kids, right? Nine kids? Eight kids? Stop me when you're going to contribute. Seven kids? See? Very difficult. Go ahead. So I just had a question about whether, since you've looked at a lot of like media portrayals and mm -hmm. magazine covers, um, if you feel like there is a difference in rhetoric around um, refugee families and um, kids that are born with families who have refugee status. Well, the, the rhetoric around refugees is, is, is slightly different, in it, but it still it revolves around two basic questions. Who deserves and who doesn't deserve? Who's deserving and undeserving? To a certain extent, refugees have historically been given a pass a little bit and considered more deserving because they said they were, they, they were fleeing not on their own accord. They were basically you know, escaping being killed or political oppression. And particularly if they fit into our Cold War contests, so the Cubans come, if we can, you know, we privilege them, we invest billions of dollars in their ability to become integrated into America, which we don't do for undocumented workers who've been here 50 years, right? Because it helps us challenge the rhetoric that somehow the communists are better than, at the time than we were. So if you can fit into a geopolitical war, then it makes you more deserving, I think, in a lot of ways. But the problem today is a lot of people who we saw as deserving as refugees, take, for example, the Cambodians who fled, who now live thousands in Long Beach, who, who are legal residents, they're green card holders, who are being deported right and left. Right? Suddenly, they're not deserving anymore because the new rhetoric is that we want to make deportation so broad that anybody should be afraid. It's Foucault in a sense, too. I mean, how do you discipline people? Well, if everybody around you is being possibility of being deported, that's going to make you straighten up. You're going to, you're going to work harder, right? You're going to, your, your work ethic is going to become stronger. You're going to do everything you can to walk the line, right? Because you're not going to, you're not going to be the problem that gets going to deport it, even if you're a legal resident. It's very Foucault, I think. It makes people, it makes people internalize their own uh, uh, set of restrictions on their lives. So I look at it in that sense. But, so refugees have become less attractive in, in, in terms of, of their uh, seeing their deservingness. You have to remember, my students often ask me, but they're refugees, shouldn't we care about refugees? I said, show me a gene for compassion. There's no, it's all, it's all political rhetoric. When you, uh, stuff I show you, it's about the hearts and minds that people are trying to sway you to their position, always. There's nothing in your genetics that says, this gene says, ooh, 
refugees deserving. No, it's all at the opinion at the time. You know, Hitler was putting people, rounding people, Jews up in much of Europe, many of them being extinguished in concentration camps. Did we let German refugees in America? No, there's nothing to say we had to, right? We didn't have to let them in, right? Who deserves the ability to come in as deserving refugees more than at that period of time? So you know, it's, it's all subject to a discourse that frames people in certain kinds of ways that allow certain kinds of actions to be taken. You know, Foucault wrote that book a long time ago. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the upcoming debate over the 2020 census and asking people whether they're citizens, are citizens or not. And this is just another, what I would call a chilling effect. You know, they're really trying to make people once again feel afraid uh, that, if, that somehow uh, you're le you have to worry about your very presence in America. Because by asking citizenship, which isn't, you know, the, the Constitution, I, mean, I know you guys all read the Constitution. The Constitution says, it doesn't say citizens almost anywhere. It talks about the people, the people of the United States, the people. The census is to get an account of the people, not the citizens, right? And so it's a real attempt, I think, to get people to feel that they shouldn't, they should be worried, they should not fill out the census, lower the numbers of people in states like where I come from, California, where we'd probably, you know, people, think about it, which, which state is under attack more in this administration than California? Where do we get so many of our Congress people from our census? What's, how, what would be a nice place to have fewer Congress people, have less people fill out the census? I mean, the logic is so clear to punish people, to punish our state, right? We have us reduce our power. And I think it makes people feel that, you know, by asking that question, that are they going to be targeted? Because you don't only really ask that question. They're going to have your address, right? They're going to have your kids' names. You can, you know, the census is about a whole bunch of information, right? And, um, yeah, I just think, I think it's a, a dangerous precedent to set if we allow that to happen. And hopefully we, we won't. But right now, it looks like it, we probably will. And I think it's going to have a, I think you're going to be able to measure the impact, I think. Because a lot of people, even if, you know, and think about the U.S. born kids who are citizens and those who want to become citizens who somehow aren't going to have anything filled out for them because the parents are so afraid, right? And I think that makes, that would, if I was a parent, I'd, given what I see happening, I, I'd, be, I'd be worried myself, actually, to tell you the truth. Hope that, hope that was a good, good answer. Um, Hello. Um, so you mentioned uh, the Chinese birth tourism and how that's a very low number, um, which I agree with. But I guess I want to understand your perspective on people who are deliberately <laughs> exploiting birthright citizenship in that way, which does seem different than people coming over and having children because, you know, human beings have children, it, it, like those do seem like very different actions. And I, I guess I want to understand how you view the Chinese um, birth Or the tourism. Koreans, a big one. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a hard answer. It's a hard question to answer. Do you have an answer? Oh, do you have an answer? And I'll see if I agree. <laughs> so I actually write about this because for me, when women come and have their babies here, they didn't come necessarily, some do, most come to work then they meet someone, and it's sort of a natural stage, life stage. Then you get married or you have a baby. It's not the other way around where you come and have a baby, then you try and make your life, right? It's hard, it, which, which could happen sometimes. But the Korean, so the, the birth tourism is a little bit different. So I'll give you my take on it in a minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, there is a lot of reproductive tourism, and it comes in different forms. Um, for many years, I was the lawyer at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health for birth registration. And um, Massachusetts has great hospitals. And people come from all over the world here. We also have a very large um, fertility clinic business and people come from all over the world here or have surrogates, hire women as gestational surrogates to have babies here. And you don't see that criticized. I thought your talk 
you know, was um, very informative. Um, but there's the politics of the Mexican border being treated differently than other borders. And um, it would be a huge problem to change the 14th Amendment, huge. Uh, so well, I agree with you on I that. I want to thank you. Um, I think you should answer okay, her think, question as, so, as well, but so, I'd also right. like to ask, um, you know, in your closing argument, what you would do or what you would urge um, be done in terms of using or countering or getting the media, you know, not to use the term anchor baby. I mean, you've written a yeah. book, but what other yeah. prescriptive suggestions do you have? Um, yeah, okay. That's my question. I'll try and get to that one. So in terms of the Korean and Chinese um, uh, birth tourism versus uh, undocumented immigrants who just happen to come to work and then wind up having babies, they're, they're a little bit distinctive. Women who come as birth tourists are typically could do so legally. So whether they choose to have a baby or not have a baby really is they're legally able to do it. They aren't coming uh, in any kind of um, underground kind of way. They get a tourist permit or they have some sort of way to come in, but it's, it's all done above board. It's legal. People advertise. People come take vacations here. And well, whereas I think it's, it's probably in one sense, you know, should we allow that to happen? I mean, people are free. If they're legally able to come into the country, they're legally able to have a baby. And so to a certain extent, how much would you start monitoring what their real intent is when they cross? I mean, we're going to kind of figure out, put them in a, some sort of a, a EKG thing and sometimes ask them, you can have a baby? Whoop! It, it starts jumping up, right? So we do the lie detector test. And I think even, I would even go further in the sense that, whereas I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to have that happen a lot, I kind of go back to Ronald Reagan, actually, which is kind of an interesting guy to go back to for me. But what he claims, that obviously, you know, what makes America great is that people want to come here. And people want to come here. I mean, if you want to make America a place where no one wants to come, you know, let's engage in having a, 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 a recession. No one came in the recession, right? There weren't a lot of babies coming, born in tourism during the recession. Even American women, I can show you the slides, had few babies during the recession because it, it dampens fertility. We could make America so unhospitable, so economically bad, so so socially nativist, so politically mean-spirited that people won't want to come to this country. But is that the country you guys want to live in? I mean, seriously. I mean, Ronald Reagan said, you know, what makes America great is that people want to come here. When people, Harvard has foreign students come here. Why? Because they want to get the education. And if we're lucky, some of those smart people will stay and contribute to America. Make a difference in America, you know. We had a guy who came from Mexico to work in, in our science programs. He joined the team that won the Nobel Prize to figure out the ozone layer. What good would it have done us to keep somebody that smart, that much of a contribution? I know some people don't believe in science and weather thing, but people, he chose to come here to make that contribution, right? If they choose to come here legally and have a baby, how, how would you? really stop them. And how do you know that baby's not going to wind up creating something that's going to cure cancer if I get it? Or help us develop a new type of phone or a way to, to, to salvage you know, food in a way that feeds more people. Because when people come here, that baby is the future. I'm not going to denigrate that child. I'm not going to denigrate the child of someone who happens to have a baby they're going to call an anchor baby. I think America has, is great, at least until recently, because we have benefited and recognize the benefit of the contributions of the children of immigrants to our way of life. I mean, take my iPhone. I mean, uh, you know, he's, he, was the, he was the son of refugees from Syria. The people we're supposed to hate. And I love my cell phone. Seriously. What good would it have been to keep, keep jobs out of here? I mean, seriously. So I, I guess basically, I don't think it's a good idea if they do it, but if they do it and it's legal, how can you stop people from doing something that's legal for them to do? I had a student, just to give you, it does create inequities. I had a student, she came to graduate school, she was from Switzerland. Her parents were on their way to Japan for a vacation. Her mother went into early pregnancy. They landed in New York, they had the baby. After they stabilized, they went on to Japan, went back to Switzerland. She didn't come back to America until she finished her degree, undergraduate degree in Switzerland, came back to our graduate program. 
She has no sense of being American. She had no sense of belonging. She didn't want to work in America. She wound up working for the UN in Europe, but she got every advantage of an American citizen. I have DACA students who are my graduate students who are worried about being deported relatively soon, who've lived their whole lives here. So it does create inequities, right? No doubt about it. Go ahead. The birth tourism, that's the entire purpose, is so that the children can have the citizenship. Then they go back home to their home country and they don't send the kids back until they're trying to go to an American school and want to get in state tuition, which is very different than this situation. And I'm not, I don't have a solution. I just, I just think that it's important for us to, I don't know, think about the things that are uncomfortable. And this is a very uncomfortable and a gray area. And I think just worth like really interrogating our views on certain. Uh, well, they wouldn't get in-state tuition unless they actually resided in the state they were gonna to go to college for X number of years. They might get in-state in high school, uh, but if they weren't, like if you came, if you're living here and you come to California as a grad, you're not gonna get in-state tuition. You're right, not, well, not. okay, so, so that might so, not be so, correct. But, just, but they so, are bringing the kids, they, or they're, they're able sending to get them back perks, too. Right, they're able to get perks. Okay. And, you know, so I have no idea. I mean, it's not necessarily good or bad, but that's what, you know, they're legally able to do it. So unless you create some laws that make it really difficult for them to do it, it's, it's going to happen. But to me, there's just not that many. Right. I mean, seriously, I mean, what is it? A couple, probably maybe less than a couple thousand any given time. I mean, it's just, it's not that many that I'd be, I'd, I'd stake my, whereas there's 800,000 dreamers that I'm more worried about getting some benefit here. I mean, that's, if I want to, if I want to fight a battle, that's where it's going to be, if you want to know the truth. And I think, um, uh, you know, whether people come, I have a lot of students in my classes sometimes, they're master students from China, and they're green card holders, sitting next to the young people who, are, who, are, who have no green cards and undocumented. And I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not against them. I said, how'd you get here? Well, my parents, they banded together, they put some money up, and it looks like we're investing in America. They immediately gave us green cards. Is that bad? That's legal, right? They're taking advantage of what we hear America wants investment in America. So you put up a certain amount of money and later you can sell that investment to another group. You and your family get automatic green cards. Now, am I gonna scream that that's so bad that I look at the inequities just in my classes and scream at these students for having taken advantage of what the law allows them to do? No, but I'm gonna scream for these students in my class to get every advantage that I think they deserve. So th that's where I see it. I'm not gonna pit in a, in a contest of deservingness, because that becomes a pissing contest that I don't really get into. I like to think there's grades of deservingness, and I see hope in everybody I see. As, a, as an educator, I have to. I mean, I, I have to see hope in all the students. And I'm not gonna uncall some of them unquestionable, unless I really see them doing stupid things like, you know, it, it, there are some students I wish didn't have the rights. When they start calling people names, start challenging their birthrights as, as anchor babies, calling them wetbacks or illegals, you know, then I wish that we could do something to help <laughs> that kind of contest. But uh, now this, I'm not gonna get in that debate because I, I think, um, like I said, we have no idea what the future is gonna bring and if that student's gonna make a major contribution to my, our way of life. And that's been the history of America. You know, just a few years ago, you didn't have to come as birthright citizenship, uh, uh, birth tourism. It, it, when people like Trump's parents came and all these other people's parents came, there was no issue if you were a birth tourist or not. You were here, and the whole idea of the 14th Amendment is that if you're here and you're born here, we're gonna make you one of us. And if you decide to leave or never come back, but if you come, you're gonna be one of us, and everything you do from that point is gonna be a contribution to making our lives better. Or we'll put you in prison <laughs> if you turn out bad. But that's the whole bargain. That's what the whole birthright citizenship means, right? We're gonna make you by birth. It's so much different than a country even where people come from birthright who are doing the birth tourism, where to be a member of the country is by blood. We have to realize what this means when we talk about birthright citizenship. That's us telling people who come here, really, you know, there's gonna be politics, some people are gonna stigmatize you, some people are gonna racialize you, but in essence, you are us because you're a citizen. You can't do that in many countries of the world because being a part of the nation is by blood. And many of them are patriarchal, so it's your father's blood, not even your mother's blood. And that means if you don't have blood of, if you're Japanese, father and mother, you're great. 
If you're Korean in Japan, three generations, you better have a passport because you're not Japanese. You're not Kuwaiti. You're not many countries of the world because you don't have the blood. So that's why for me, the birthright citizenship is such an important thing. It really makes countries like us and most of the Americas stand apart from places that have the idea that if you don't have the blood of the people around you, you'll, you might as well just give it up because you'll never be part of us. That's why I fight for birthright citizenship. And I think it's really important for us to always remember that. If we want to talk about this, what makes America distinctive, to me, that's one of the things that makes us distinctive. And that doesn't mean you're going to get a free card. It doesn't mean people are going to chastise you, yell at you, racialize you. It just means they can't take that citizenship away from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.